Welcome to another episode of the Simulated Universe with Riz Vert. My guest today is Rodney Asher, who's the director of the new documentary, A Glitch in the Matrix. And his previous films, which some of you may have seen, include Room 237, about people that were obsessed with uh, The Shining, uh, and The Nightmare, which was about people who were obsessed or having issues with sleep paralysis. Um, so with that said, let's jump right in. Welcome, Rodney. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Good to talk to you, man. Yeah, great to talk to you as well. You know, I saw the uh, the film uh, just uh, when it first came out about a month ago, and uh, it was very different from from what I had expected originally. <laughs> I'm glad uh, to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, before we jump in, I mean, did you know that uh, this year was going to be the year of simulation movies when you came out with this? I mean, I just wrote an article saying that in 99, there were three simulation movies, Matrix, 13th Floor, and Existence. And this year, there's actually going to be four that are coming out. <laughs> Well, what's the fourth? I know we've got ours and Bliss opened on yeah. the same day, so, which is kind of a hilarious coincidence. Yeah, that was interesting. And then uh, Free Guy is coming out. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Free Guy. It's about the NPC, right? <laughs> yep, exactly. Where he's the NPC that tries to save. So, I mean, that's more of a comedy. They're all different genres, which is interesting. Um, and yeah, then we but have Matrix you know, I know Four. That- coming out in December, I think, yeah. Yeah, I, I, but you know, I know both in, in my film and from an episode or two of this podcast that I listened to that um, synchronicities seem to have a way of coming up, right? And the fact that there are four, not only that there are four this year, but two of us, but two of us dropped on the same day seemed especially noteworthy. <laughs> right, so that wasn't planned by you in any case, huh, right? Well, I mean, those sorts of coincidences, you know, have a way of being attracted to these projects, right? Like, you know, for one thing, you know, we did, you know, most of the interviews in the film in 2019. And, you know, I chose for a handful of reasons, you know, most specifically, you know, to keep everything sort of within the digital world to do, to do the interviews over, you know, webcams using Skype. And now that the film is coming out, you know, mid pandemic, hopefully will hopefully soon to be post pandemic, you know, these sorts of zoom windows, you know, are the world that we're trapped in living in, you know, and that's the, the fact that it looks like it was created under pandemic situations under quarantine situations. It's just another strange coincidence right that's right so that's another glitch in the matrix and you know i i I use that term since 2013 or so to talk about synchronicities and uh i I don't recall in the film that you talked that much about synchronicities did you a little bit um i think the most significant place where we do is one of our four you know we call them eyewitnesses these these guys who you know live their lives and, you know, really deeply affected by simulation theory, having, you know, come to believe it or taking it very, very seriously. One of them, and this was important to me because of how often synchronicities seem to come up in these conversations. One of them went down the path that led him to simulation theory, um, inspired by a series of synchronicities, right? Like there's the brother Mistwood that at a certain point they started happening again and again and again. And he went to this extraordinary measure of reorganizing his calendar and living by this 12 day week and right. using that tool in the you know sort of Excel spreadsheet that that created for him became an easier way to track these synchronicities that the same <laughs> things would happen on the third days or the 11th days or the seventh days or however it worked. And that's what sent him, you know, to the, um, what that sensor deprivation chamber where he had kind of that, you know, mind blowing kind of, um, you know, insight that, that, that happened all at once, right? That almost ecstatic religious experience, which reminded me a lot of, you know, Philip K. Dick. Right. Now, I, I saw that you had uh, quoted Philip K. Dick quite a bit uh, with footage from his Mets uh, sci-fi convention speech. And, uh, you know, the first episode of this podcast, I interviewed, uh, Tessa B. Dick, who was, uh, you know, his wife and, you know, he, he, uh, definitely, uh, you know, thought about this idea a lot. And so I'm curious, you know, what, what got you to use so much of, of, of his footage and what lines from his speech. And I, and it's interesting as another synchronicity, 
when I saw this movie, I was just finishing up my next book, which is The Simulated Multiverse. And turns mm -hmm. out a lot of his speech, I, I ended up using a lot of it in the book because he talked a lot about different realities and timelines and stuff. But, but I'm curious as to which parts of his speech, you know, you, you thought were the, the most interesting and that, you know, what that convinced you to really use a bunch of his footage, you know, in the movie. Yeah, well, I mean, I had heard that little four minute bit, you know, was on YouTube for years. Yep. And um, I knew that that wanted to be, you know, at least a small section of the movie. And then we were able to track down the entirety of the speech. And, you know, I loved how many pieces of it seemed to tie into I don't know, kind of contemporary thoughts about these subjects. I mean, one of the one of the big ones and, you know, is the way that he talked about, you know, sort of the past changing. You know, and I listened to that episode, you know, that you did um, with Tessa <laughs> yeah, and great. talking about the light switch moving. And right. it's funny because in my memory, you know, and maybe the past has changed, but, <laughs> you know, in my memory, it was the light switch moved from like one side of the wall to the other. And the way she described it was that it devolved from a light switch to a pull chain, which right. almost sounds like, you know, Ubik, right? Where everything is sort of de-evolving to earlier versions of themselves. Yep. <laughs> but as he would describe, you know, both little things like that or, you know, bigger things like what well, the Axis power won World War II. And then right. that was more recently, you know, revised and changed. It reminded me an awful lot, you know, of people describing, you know, those Mandela effects. You know, people, a lot of the only, you know, people remembering that Berenstain Bears was spelled differently, you know, or that Kit Kat had a dash in it and those sorts of things. And if you go on, you know, those Reddit pages or other sort of, you know, online forums, people will catalog those and oftentimes talk about them as evidence of, you know, a crack in the simulation or the past being changed. Right. And the way that he talked about that same thing back in the 70s was really significant you know, to me, um, you know, as well as, you know, how he blended, you know, a lot of these ideas that at one point start technological, but, you know, in his tellings very quickly become religious. And that was a direction that I was surprised the film went, but almost everyone I spoke to kind of blur, you know, veered off the path and got into religious thoughts. I mean, some of them more or less accidentally, but, you know, Eric Davis, um, who wrote that book, Technosis, you know, about sort of the overlapping of technology and religion. And he's somebody who would be, who I think you would love <laughs> to talk to. Yeah, I should and, get him on the podcast. <laughs> you totally get him. And, yeah. and one of the things, you know, that he said before we, before we recorded his interview was that he wanted to emphasize simulation theories, similarities to, you know, sort of older religious philosophical traditions. Um, so, um, you know, all those things kind of called out and started overlapping in, in interesting ways. Yeah, you know, uh, Philip K. Dick, he actually talked about at one point the, the programmer and the counter programmer. Yeah. <laughs> and the reason in, in that speech, which I don't know if you mentioned the title of it in your uh, in your movie, but it was, if you think this world is bad, you should see some of the others, right? <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, but he always talked about, you know, the programmer and the counter programmer going forward a few steps and then deciding to change things and changing variables and then, and then moving forward again, which, uh, you know, was quite In some ways, the way he described it on paper to me read more like he was talking about an author than a computer programmer, right? Like there are parts of the speech where he says that each iteration of the world, each of these changes is to make the world a better place. Right. And he, and I think he specifically compared it to, you know, successive drafts of a novel that you're always revising to make it better. Though of course, in the way he describes it, it's not better, just better dramatically, but it's also better in that it is kinder. It is more good. It is, you know, um, it, it is more godly. Right. And so, you know, in, in his case, you know, he had this kind of overarching idea that they were playing this game and then rewinding it and making it better each time. Uh, I mean, w w with religion, there's obviously a lot of overlap, right? Um, and and have you gotten reaction from, you know, people in the religious community at all? I mean, I, I dedicated about a third of my book to religion, which 
the people in the scientific community didn't like. I mean, they kind of ripped me for it. Say, why did you talk about religion for a third of the book? Which, you know, for me was an essential part of of, of this theory and and treating it as a metaphor. So I'm, I'm curious, like, what reactions you're getting from either the scientific community or the religious community? Well, I mean, the reaction. I mean, the re the reactions that I get that are in depth are more from the film community, right? Um, yep. But. I get short, I get short passing asides from, from from those other worlds as well. Um, you know, I think from a scientific community, um, there is there is sometimes criticism that the movie is not rigorously scientific enough. But you know, of course, I, that, it was never my intent to make a piece of science journalism. And for me, what I found dramatic and interesting, and maybe also I think maybe what I had to offer here were more personal human stories that, you know, there are science and technology journalists who can dig into, you know, quantum mechanics or string theory, but that is so far outside of my wheelhouse. But what's not is connecting some of these ideas to the history of science fiction or sitting down with people who've had some of these extraordinary experiences and getting them and, and, and getting them to both tell me about where they were in their lives when simulation theory seemed to be the answer that made the most sense, and then to reflect back on um, on what that means to them. And of course, you know, I have a little bit of a background in animation as well as genre film to try to bring those stories to life dramatically. You know, I'm a kid in the candy store when I get to you know animate, you know. A, you know, a, a drunk driving um, car accident off a cliffside in Cuernavaca, um, which is the kind of place that I can really, I think that I, that I think I can really personally dig in. You know, so if I got a little bit of that from the science community, and again, you know, if, and, I, I'd say, and it was similar with um, the nightmare too, right? Like if someone were doing a serious study of sleep paralysis, I think what I've got are some provocative case studies, but and that and, and that's where I and, and that's where I have that's where I focus both my that's where I fo focus my interest really, um, and from religious folks, again I don't get I, I haven't gotten a ton I've gotten a couple of people who are afraid the movie is sort of embracing or promoting nihilism which. I don't think it does, and it certainly doesn't mean to. Um, while, although, if anything, I thought that you know we were doing something that was sort of a cautionary tale, talking about the dangers of this leading to solipsism and nihilism. Um, but I've also gotten, you know, in balance, the reactions have been really positive, right? And you know, I'm still at the stage in my career that if anybody um, just thinks that this movie is worth sitting down and writing a paragraph or two about. You know, I'm kind of astonished that you know the extent of their interview, uh, the extent of the review isn't. This isn't a real movie. <laughs> um, right. You know, and it's also they're so idiosyncratic in their format that um, you know I don't expect everybody to like them. <laughs> right. Well, let's talk a little bit about the process. I mean, when you originally decided to make this movie. You know, wh where did the idea come from? And was it always going to be about these people who believe they were in a simulation or did it kind of evolve to that? You know? Well, I think that was always going to be the way it would work. In fact, it's a little, the, the fact that we have quote unquote, you know, experts in the movie is sort of a departure for me at all. That, you know, in the past, you know, I've solely focused on the first person experience and there's a direct path between the nightmare in this film and within the nightmare when i was talking to people who experience sleep paralysis which you know very short version of that is it's a sort of a state of consciousness that happens either when you're falling asleep or when you wake up and you sort of come back to and you're fully conscious and aware but you're unable to move and in that state people frequently see these sort of sinister shadowy forms shadow people but you know it's also a very blurry experience and you know there are a thousand variations of, of of what it can be like but one of the people i spoke to off camera told me that what they thought they were seeing these shadowy figures were a peak beyond the simulation that these were the programmers 
perhaps counter programmers. <laughs> and at that point, I wasn't, so this was probably about 2014. I wasn't, I, I wasn't really aware of simulation theory. I mean, I was aware of science fiction ideas that we were living in a giant video game and a computer program, but not that anyone took it seriously. You know, so I went home after that interview and looked it up and very quickly came across, you know, um, Bostrom's simulation hypothesis. And it remained something I was interested in, you know, for years. And as time would go on, you know, I would see things like, and there's some BBC special about it that, um, um, who narrated it, uh, Morgan Freeman. Um, and there were a lot of really interesting aspects of it, but, and it, and, and, it, and it drilled down deeper into the science. And it kind of confirmed for me that as I watched it, it didn't have the thing that I was most interested in, right? Which were interviews with people who had undergone extraordinary experiences and came to believe that we were living in the simulation, especially after, you know, reading a lot of first person accounts online of, you know, people who went through things that, you know, sound like nonfiction Twilight Zone stories, right? Um, you know, and then there was that, you know, Elon Musk, you know, was spoke about, spoke about simulation theory at that conference and Mandela effect became a thing that everybody wanted to talk to, you know, for a few months. Yep. So it was like everywhere I was looking, I was coming across this idea. And when I put it in context with some of the other projects I've done, right, which are all about sort of people wrestling with mysteries, right? If 237 is about people you know, trying to understand secrets, you know, hidden within Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. And I thought that that could translate, that could be sort of a, a way to talk about people trying to understand, you know, all sorts of, well, movies or books or artwork or music. And that the nightmare is sort of about people trying to understand the supernatural, you know, via this one, um, via this one state of consciousness. And that, you know, it, opened up a question, you know, that I think is still for me kind of open. These things that people see, you know, are they coming from inside or are they coming from outside? Um, and then, you know, this one, you know, look, you, is like widening the lens to the point where if we're trying to understand art or the supernatural, this is trying to understand, you know, the world. <laughs> so in a way it feels like the climax of, you know, this kind of three movie, uh, cycle. So once I was able to sort of see it that way and, and, and read enough first person accounts that I thought that I could find these people. Um, you know, the where, where did you read these first person that. accounts? Just in random places like Reddit and places like that? Reddit has got a bulk of them. Yeah, did you go into the glitch in the matrix? Oh, um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Reddit, yeah. That's a great one, right? Yeah. <laughs> and in fact, there were, you know, there, were some, there were some stories in there that I would have loved to have told, but for one reason or another, we weren't able to find these people or they didn't check out. Um, but in a way, sort of doing a nonfiction Twilight Zone movie was a big part you know, of the inspiration for that. Um, and that was just evidence too that that the people were out there, and I also would see them just commenting on, you know, if there's a YouTube art, if there's a YouTube story about simulation theory, that there'd be a hundred comments under it of, you know, I believe it because X, Y, and Z happened to me, right? So, in, in the original conception of the film, it was only going to be those stories, but then when I was able to talk to Bostrom and some other folks. You know, and it became clear that, you know, they had, they didn't necessarily have a certainty that it's true. They were just exploring it as a possibility that right. um, for a while I was, you know, asking myself, well, do they count? Should they be, be in here? And I, you know, finally opened up and gave myself permission to allow a small number of experts to be sort of color com commentators. And yeah, who, who were the experts you had? Yeah, Bostrom? Who were some of the other experts that you had on? Well, there's Eric Davis, who was right. able to both because he, you know, what because he was part of the team that edited Philip K. Dick's Exegesis, he could speak very directly about Philip K. Dick, and he was also, um, you know, has written extensively about you know mystical religious traditions. So he could be the one to compare this to you know Maya or Gnosticism, you know, or other religious ideas when we're taking 
you know, simulation theory as a, uh, you know, as a metaphor. And then there was Emily Podest, who's an artist and a writer. And she had this amazing article about Plato's cave, like putting it into perspective with sort of 21st century digital thought. Um, you know, so there's a handful of these folks who kind of think we're able to put the idea in, in, in slightly different contexts. Yeah. Well, you mentioned earlier that you, the interviews you did, the first person interviews, you didn't, you did them on Skype before the pandemic. And, uh, but for anyone who's seen the trailers or, or seen pictures of it, they'll know that you're actually seeing these avatars, right? These video game characters. So when was that decision made and how did that kind of play into the whole process of making this movie? Yeah, well, that was, that was an early, early idea. I didn't necessarily know they were going to look like video game characters. You know, I wasn't sure what they were going to be, but just sort of the mismatch of, you know, the um, unvarnished reality of whatever their Skype backgrounds were with some sort of an animated artificial character seemed like it would have something interesting to, that, that it would reflect on, you know, sort of digital communication, digital worlds, digital unreality in an interesting way. I mean, not the least of which is because, you know, when I'm messaging somebody, right, they see, you know, I'm speaking via, you know, this tiny little icon, it's a still picture. And, you know, some people use photos of themselves, some people use cartoon characters, you know, yeah. ditto Facebook, Twitter, you know, what have you, and they're already, you know, these, um, like Snapchat and Instagram filters where people can add animated qualities to their, to their faces. And it feels like it's going to be more and more of a common thing. Um, you know, so we kind of explored different approaches to what they would be like, but at a certain point, um, the video game idea, you know, and they're supposed to look sort of like Fortnite characters, right? And perhaps, you know, you would look at them and think that maybe this is a character from some show from the 80s that I don't quite remember, um, but because I, I love seeing the way that like Fortnite will port in a character like Deadpool or, you know, Kylo Ren, you know, and my son plays that game a lot and I'm completely, you know, struck and fascinated watching him and his friends meet in Fortnite. And they're, you know, these seven and a half foot tall cybernetic warriors, but they're talking about fifth grade and they're talking about their family or they're talking about hot dogs, you yeah. know, and, you know, Fortnite is not just a game. It's a place and it's a place, you know, where, where, where people meet, but they meet in these other bodies, right? You know, so that notion, you know, as well as, you know, maybe it's kind of fun to see the video game character on their day off, like that, there's that cartoon, there's a Warner Brothers cartoon where um, the sheepdog and the coyote, after a day of hitting each other over the head with, cl uh, with clubs or pushing one another off of cliffs, they punch, they, they, they punch out for their coffee break and they sit in a room together and they have a cup of coffee and they open up an egg salad sandwich, you know, and they catch up on their personal lives. <laughs> and, and I love seeing, you know, larger than life characters in these mundane situations. Um, you know, and lastly, you know, it was, it was funny because once the, once the die was cast, it gave us all sorts of also all sorts of bonuses and maybe the biggest one was that when we did you know the reenactments we were able to use those characters right we didn't need to you know if we were doing like a america's most wanted you know kind of a kind of a shot on film reenactment we'd have to find somebody who had you know we put a fake mustache or, or wig on on an actor to make them try to look like the interview subject or the suspect <laughs> and this allows yeah. us to use you know, that character, you know, the actual character, you know, so there were a lot of, you know, fun kind of, um, you know, bonuses that that got us. Yeah, that's really interesting. Speaking of uh, your son and that generation, I mean, to them living inside a video game is not that strange of a concept. Uh, and, you know, I find that for, for younger people, it's, it's a way for them to understand what the religions have been telling us all along. So I'm curious, what has he, has he seen the movie? Has your son seen the movie? What people or, or other kids or schools or teachers, you know, I know there's a dark element to the movie too, which we'll talk about in a minute, but I'm, I'm curious as to the reaction you've had from sort of younger, younger people. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny because um, I mean, he, he also contributed to it, right. That um, 
Minecraft aqueduct that you see at the beginning, he created. Right. <laughs> and then, you know, my best friend going back into the 20th century, he did a lot of the animation. His kids did the animation within Minecraft that that dolly shot that travels down the aqueduct that he built. Right. So some of the animation team, you know, were like 10 or 11 years old. And, you know, he was going to watch it right when it was you know, Sundance was virtual this year. So we had like the friends that were quarantining with that came over and it came on, but, and he was going to watch it, but he and his friend just went into the other room and watched YouTube videos instead. <laughs> he just wasn't that interested in seeing it. Um, and I think he might be, I mean, besides the fact that, as you say, it gets a little grim in the, in the second half, um, you know, he, he, he might be a little below the age, but I've got a friend who's a filmmaker and it was the most hilarious thing that um, he's much more accomplished than me, an award-winning, you know, kind of, you know, somebody whose work I, I really admire. And he texted me that, you know, his 13 year old son, or maybe he's 15, um, walk into the room while he was watching Glitch in the Matrix and said, oh my God, what is this? And sat down and was glued to it, even though he refuses to watch any of his dad's movies. <laughs> And he's like, That's I don't part know. of it too. Yeah. He said it's probably because there's a lot of video game imagery in this. Yeah. That it is, you know, like Room Two Three Seven is an archive film, but most of the archives are from movies, and most of them are from movies pre 1980, yes. which is probably you know absolute poison, you know, <laughs> to kids. <laughs> but right. it might be that the animation and the um you know, in the, in, 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 in the video game footage and the YouTube, and there's a lot of YouTube footage in there too, because you know, that's such a big part of the media environment that we're swimming in these days. Um, yeah, um, it, it, it drew that one unscientific, the <laughs> chosen um, kid right into it. Yeah, for those that haven't seen the movie, there's a lot of animation in the film and there's a lot of clips from different movies as well. Uh, so sticking to the process for a little bit, um, uh, you ended up, uh, how did you end up finding these people and, uh, you know, that you interviewed the, the main kind of characters, I guess we'd call them. And were there others that you wish that you had time to include? Uh, and were there or some that you just thought were totally nuts and you didn't want to include them for that reason? Or, you know, what, what's the spectrum, I guess, of the candidates you found? How did you find them? And then how did you choose uh, who, who to put in? Yeah, well, they found us. We, we announced that we were making the film and we put up a, a site online and, you know, Boing Boing wrote a thing about it and there might've been another article or two. And very quickly, you know, we had an almost a hundred people submitted their stories and their information. And, you know, I probably, you know, interviewed maybe 20 of them and, you know, they would break down into types in a way. Um, you know, I think a dirty secret of documentaries that, um, maybe doesn't get discussed a lot, but there's a lot of casting that goes on. And, you know, one of the things I was looking for was, you know, somebody who, um, again, went through a strange twilight zone kind of experience. And in a way that that Mexican car crash kind of fulfilled that. Certain, certainly the, the fact that that story would be a, a spectacular visual made it really interesting. But also, you know, things of, well, what was it that drove these people that pointed them in the direction of simulation theory, right? That, you know, when Brother Mistwood talks about it as a epiphany was striking to me, both because of, you know, the Philip K. Dick connection, but, you know, also going back to, you know, again, religious tradition, right? Like Paul, you know, on the road to Tarsus getting falling off the donkey and being enlightened, or even John Smith, I think, who was visited that there's all the, there are story after story of, you know, prophets getting a bolt of wisdom instantly, you know, and saying, you know, it happened 2000 years ago. So it is a holy tradition, but if it happened last year, you know, people might, <laughs> might doubt your sanity and, and, and why is that, but, but, but why should that be different? Right. Um, and he was also the one, he mentioned all the synchronicities and that got him to the short, you know, and that kind of thing would get people to the short list. Um, I think I forgot the second part. Were, of your were there people that you interviewed that you thought, okay, these, these, this guy is just too out there. I'm not, you know, 
not necessarily <laughs> want to have him or her in the film. Well, I mean, if there was a genuine, if, if there was a suspicion of like a genuine mental health issue, yeah. um, I suppose I might have discounted someone, but I don't think that I sensed that. You know, in you know, in the you know, we keep teasing the darker element of the story when we talk to Josh Cook. You know, mental illness is a part of his story, and he's very upfront and frank about that. You know, so um, you know that wasn't going to necessarily get him disqualified, but it was something that. I, th I thought we we would need to address responsibly. Um, you know, there are just people who, I, I, I mean, the, the easiest way to get rejected was just not to be very interesting to say, oh, I had a hunch and it feels right. And not right. to be able to, <laughs> or not to, not to be terribly reflective. Like the story is one thing, but it's also important to me that people keep returning to these stories in, in mining them for meaning. Right. Even like the, the car crash thing, the guy goes back and he's like, the odds of this happening were so astronomical. The only conclusion I could draw, you know, was that somebody has their thumb on the scale. You know, and that's, a, I think, a meaningful way for someone to make a, you, you know, to, 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 to sort of come to their worldview. You know, and he says flat out. Other people might have taken that as a sign of, you know, of, of a guardian angel or a religious in, intervention. But, you know, I don't believe in any of that baloney. But simulation theory seems plausible, right? So it's like that, that second part, that wrestling is really important. I mean, I think one of my biggest influences is this American life. And most of those stories have both of those aspects. Somebody will talk about, you know, some unusual, interesting, funny, tragic, you know, a heartwarming thing that happened to them. But then they also revisit it and they can talk at length about what it means. And, you know, it, it's important for me to get both of those sides too. Otherwise, I don't know, the stories might lack an emotional charge in their yeah. way. Yeah. That makes sense. Did you think about uh, interviewing the, the Wachowskis at all? You know, the creators of The Matrix? Yeah. I mean, the truth is I didn't. The yeah. movie is not really about The Matrix. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I'm much more, I was, again, I was, I was much more interested to get, you know, a story about, um, you know, Paul being at a backyard barbecue, talking to his uncle, you know, who tells him, well, if nothing's real, then I can do, then everything is permitted and I can, you know, shoot our neighbors or I can shoot you. Right. And what that moment meant to him is, uh, is a story that I thought only I could tell that, you know, people have talked about the making of the matrix and they're on, they're on, they're, they're, they're on record in other places. So yeah. I thought, um, you know, these were the kind of stories that I wanted to pursue instead. Yeah, makes sense. Well, let's talk a little bit about the, the dark side. I mean, it was actually a darker movie than I, than I expected. And maybe because that stretch that you have of uh, Joshua Cook really sticks in, 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 in your mind after you see it, even though it's you know, only a small percentage of the film, uh, I think it has an outsized impact. So, you know, what went in the decision for that? And for those who don't know, uh, maybe you can give some background on, on, on him and why you included him in the movie. Sure. Well, you know, in my research into simulation theory, like at one point I had this, you know, giant, you know, eight foot long, you know, kind of whiteboard that had every interesting aspect, you know, of simulation theory that I could think of, you know, three quarters of which, you know, never made it into the movie. You know, it I would have loved to have had something about quantum suicide, but that didn't make it, that, that we, we didn't find a, a spot for that. But one phrase that was up there that stayed and that we kept thinking about was the matrix defense, which is, you know, it's a version of the insanity defense, you know, and it's also similar to the taxi driver defense in which, you know, someone pleads not guilty, you know, um, for reasons of insanity. And more specifically, they thought they were living in, you know, something more or less like the matrix. And, you know, if you think about the insanity defense largely, you know, I believe it's about, um, you know, you don't really understand the ramifications of your actions. And if you think that, you know, the world is a digital fantasia and everybody else are AI phantoms, then, you know, you're not necessarily understanding the real world ramifications of your actions. And 
you know, we found, you know, maybe there were about a half dozen, um, maybe a little bit more people who have used the defense. And it was actually producers at the company I was working, working with on this campfire, um, Colin and Rebecca found Josh Cook, who's been in prison since, I think it's maybe, might be 2003, um, after, well, you know, he, he killed his, his parents. And when in working with his lawyers at one point, they didn't wind up using it, but they can, they, they strongly considered it because he was among other things, deeply obsessed with the matrix. And when we reached out to him, you know, because again, you know, the, the way I like to tell these stories with sort of first person narratives with kind of an emotional charge, I didn't want to have talked to a law professor to explain the history of the matrix defense. I wanted to talk to someone who had gone through it or someone who had, who had been their first person. And I didn't know how much of a story I was going to use, but I mean, he's also in a place in his life where, you know, he's found meaning by like, he wrote a book about his experience and he's trying to reach out however he can, you know, to, to troubled kids, you know, and to help them not repeat, you know, the mistakes that he did. Right. And when he tells his story, you know, the matrix is one aspect of it, though, in a way, I kind of think of it as the avatar that he chose, right? If he did it, you know, 15 years later, it could have been John Wick, though. I don't know that we need, need to stay <laughs> with Keanu Reeves, um, <laughs> yeah, but it, right. it, it, yeah. it could have been the Old West. It could have been the Bible, but the matrix is what he fixated on. But his story is also about, um, you know, undiagnosed mental health. And even about, you know, lax gun control. Right? He's like, I'm the last person that anyone should have sold a gun to. And he was kind of shocked at how easy it was for him to get it. Um, but the way he talked about the matrix in the, first, in the first part of his story was really interesting because in some ways it's similar to the way other people talk about it. In fact, you know, I was, you know, chatting with some of the other people who were in the movie, you know, after they'd seen it. And, you know, one guy in particular was like, yeah, no, I was listening to Josh Cook's story. And, you know, for the first couple of chapters, I was like, uh-huh, uh-huh. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. And then there's a point where it's like, well, I don't go there. Uh-oh. <laughs> and, but, you know, that, 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 that awful night, you know, and, and just was, no, he shot his his parents, right? His, his yeah. He, 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 After he, watching the Matrix, like a couple like dozen hundreds times. of times, hundreds yeah. of times. I think he <laughs> yeah. watched it two or three times that day. Yeah. Um, he um. What what uh, 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 another notion about you know why it sort of gets placed in the movie where it is is that in the first half of the movie, there's an awful lot of talk about you know sort of the dangers of this kind of thinking of especially you know um you know the, the sort of solipsism that simulation theory can lead to and you know of course as i think of simulation theory you know i'm sure everybody has got sort of their own versions of it you know but i sort of see one of the first forks in the road is the question of other people and there's a whole chapter called yeah. other people right and the notion of well in the simulation that you're imagining is everybody equally real? You know, are we all either the same sorts of AIs or are we all tethered to real people out there or however it works is, or, you know, the basest way is everybody the same, whatever our true nature is. Right, and I always call that the NPC versus RPG, you know, version exactly. of simulation theory. Exactly. Are, if everybody's, and that's kind of how I avoid go, getting into that dark place is if you assume everybody's an NPC, that's one thing, but in the matrix, everybody except for agent smith actually was in a pod so if you're actually hurting someone you're, you're hurting an, an actual person just like you so it kind of brings up a very big dichotomy i think you know in, in how yeah well that, that, that's that's a great way to compare them and i know i was talking to i was talking to these guys on the the weird studies podcast which if you don't know it, you would really like it um but they were talking about the notion of if you're not sure you know which of those two you're in the safer bet is to go with RPG in a way it's sort of like Pascal's wager that <laughs> right. the consequences of choosing wrong of are much higher, you know, when you go, when you go with NPC, 
the consequences of being wrong, assuming that everyone's equal, are more or less minor. But the consequences of assuming everybody else is an NPC, you know, can be catastrophic. And yep. in the earlier parts of the movie, people talk about sort of the dangers of living your life like it's a video game. And a lot of them are kind of abstract, you know, and sort of hypotheticals, though there is a brief mention of that guy who stole an airplane in Seattle and was able to fly it because he had done so much time on the flight simulator. Um, but it felt, you know, in the film, you know, after maybe an hour or so of a lot of abstract thinking, to get to a, a real, a story in the real world that has real consequences. Um, yeah, makes sense. Well, you mentioned this, this whiteboard, right, that had all these different threads that you were thinking of following up yeah. on. And you actually got quite a few, you know, into the movie. Uh, I was actually surprised at how many different things you got in there. But, you know, what were some of the threads that didn't make it in? You mentioned quantum suicide. Were there other threads that you were thinking about uh, or even going more deeply in the religious side or, you know? Yeah, well, you know, it was interesting that the, the notion of the danger of sort of nested simulations was a place that I wanted to go. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes making these sorts of projects, you know, as opposed to say a Michael Moore or even an Adam Curtis thing where the filmmaker is more actively in the movie and isn't just um, assembling other people's words is sometimes there are words that you want mentioned and you can't find anybody <laughs> to be the mouthpiece for them. But I don't know, at some point I had come across the idea that, you know, if this world is a simulation of the past, right? And that's kind of inspired, like Bostrom uses the word ancestor simulations, yep. which to me suggests, you know, that it's a, in a way, a historical artifact that allows for people outside of the simulation to, to study their own past. Um, he didn't specifically say, you know, when I tried to pin him down on that, he didn't specifically yeah. identify it that way, but it was sort of what it occurred to in my imagination. And from there, I went to the idea of, well, if this is the past of the real world, you know, at the, whatever point the simulation got built, when we reached that and built our own simulation, right. um, again, having done a lot of work in the animation, you know, nesting projects within projects is a way of really consuming a huge amount of processing power. And I'm like, is, so is there a danger of, you know, let's say it's the year 2075 when we create the simulation, when yep. we get to virtual 2075 and we build this, build the simulation or multiple simulations and turn them on, you know, does that dim the lights <laughs> for a moment? <laughs> right. As, and the, yeah. as the processor one level up has to do yep. those simulations too. And then within those simulations that they get to 2075. Um, and I was actually trying to find a way to get him to talk about how that could be dangerous because, you know, somebody turns on the simulation and then crashes the computer that they're on themselves and ends the world, which, right. <laughs> which I thought was kind of a fun science fictional idea, but he didn't want to go there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, I thought you did a good job with the editing that you, you know, pulled him for, for Bostrom, because if you listen to him on Joe Rogan or other places, sometimes it, it, it's difficult for people to get the idea, but I thought you did a good job in that. Oh, that. Well, thanks. And I, I really love talking with him in, in hindsight, maybe a, a bit of that conversation that, I don't know, maybe it will go into, maybe it'll become a deleted scene because I thought it was so fun was, you know, I asked him which science fiction movies about simulations did he find um, the most compelling or the most accurate. Um, yeah. And, you know, I thought that he was, you know, I, I suspected, you know, that he might go with World on a Wire, you know, if he'd done sort of a deep dive, you know, or or 13th Existence. Floor, which was the kind of... Yeah, Existence is my right? personal favorite. Um, but he said Groundhog Day. Oh, right. <laughs> which, is, yeah. which is awesome because especially, you know, again, as, you know, this movie becomes eerily like the world that we live in, a lot of us have been in Groundhog Day for not almost a year at this point <laughs> where, you know, you don't leave the house and you live a very similar day again and again and again. And I had the unique pleasure of being able to tell him that that type of movie has since become a genre with Edge of Tomorrow and Russian Doll and Palm Springs <laughs> and, <laughs> right. Happy, and Happy Death Day. 
Yeah, that's right. And actually, you know, it turns out that was the impetus for Philip K. Dick's, you know, belief in all of this was that he felt like we were reliving the same events again, but doing it differently, right? And, and so you get to this point in Groundhog Day where, you, you know, what is it I'm supposed to do while I'm here to get to get the perfect score in the game? I keep replaying that scene again and again. Yeah, well, it's great because that movie, like, never comes right out and said I, I believe there was an earlier draft where they kind of said what had happened and what he was supposed to do but I loved the notion of he's trying to figure out well what is my point here right because I had a similar conversation I was talking to someone else about uh, uh, about the movie and you know and, and again about the video game violence within yeah. it you know and I was saying you know I'm not an anti-video game activist or a lot, I and I'm not suggesting that you know, people who play video games are going to become violent. That I think the question I'm asking more is, if people lived in our world the way they live in video games, that would likely be a bad thing, considering <laughs> what those worlds are created for, right? And like you can try to live in Fortnite, you know, as a pacifist, right? Like, and there are people who do those <laughs> those videos where they make a speed run without trying to, you know, trying to be nonviolent, but that's not what the game is designed for. And of course, you know, if you go as above, so below and come out a layer to our world, you know, it asks, I think a pretty provocative question of, well, then what is this? What are the incentives in, in, in what this world is designed to make you do, you know, and how do you win? Right, and you know, people ask me all the time, so what is the purpose of this simulation? And I say, well, what is your purpose for playing video games, right? <laughs> And it's to have experiences that you can't necessarily have outside of the game. Like I can't fly on a dragon and kill orcs in real life, quote unquote. And so it's possible that what we're doing here are experiences that we can't necessarily have, which is a little bit different than the ancestor simulation model. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I find sort of a half dozen possible scenarios for it, right? That um, I think one of them is about doing something, you know, I mean, one, one other reason that you do a simulation is to, um, to do something safely that you can't do outside the simulation. For instance, you know, um, what a uh, flight simulator, right? That you can learn to fly by crashing that plane a hundred times without consequences. <laughs> um, right. You know, I know I was really struck. So or sort of, I guess this, you know, we were maybe, you know, in, in the, home stretch of the edit, you know, when, um, when COVID struck, when I saw the New York Times had a little sort of flash animation thing on their website, which was a um, sort of infection simulator. Mm. And I, if you remember seeing this, it was just a bunch of, it was a little square with blue dots bouncing from one edge to the other, to the other, you know, and then a red dot would appear. And every time it touched a blue dot, the blue dot would turn red. And it was sort of modeling the way that infections can spread. And there were different variables that you could adjust that would result in, you know, the infection within the simulation spreading quicker or slower, mm. you know, and because I was, you know, simulation theory 247, when I looked at that thing, you know, there was the horror of, oh no, what's it like to be one of those blue dots and not to understand that and the cruelty that you of realizing that you're there in order to get infected, in order for someone else to learn from your experience. Um, I think maybe the flip side of that that I liked, and it's it's funny because in a way this has become one of the bigger lessons from the movie for me, even though it's not like positioned anywhere you know where it feels like a, a final conclusion because. Well, you know, probably because they don't have a final conclusion so much as more questions. Yeah. But there's a point where Paul Good is talking about um, GANs, generative adversarial networks, mm. and comparing the simulation to that. And the more I think about it, the more I like that idea, you know, that he says, you know, you have a pair of AIs who are in competition with each other, breaking each other down. He uses the example of one creates an increasingly lifelike photograph and the other one scans it and finds what's wrong with it. And then the other one learns from it and makes a better one. And this competition, this adversarial relationship they have is a way of you know, using these AIs to very quickly 
solve a problem, you know, in this case, how to make a realistic looking photograph of a new person quicker than, you know, a person working alone can. Right, because they can go through a, a very large number of iterations very quickly, like with and Alpha Go, is and they're to it, right? yeah, and they're fun, like it's playing itself in the game of Go or chess and learning the rules as it goes along. <laughs> you know, so imagining you know a simulation in which all of our struggles against one another, and all both of, both our collaborations and our confrontations, all have meaning that way. You know that we're all we may not be aware of what the bigger problem that we're solving is you know but in a way i think that is a is a way to use the simulation theory as a metaphor that is kind of inspirational you know that there's a purpose to to suffering and conflict and as, as well as you know collaboration and enjoy yeah no I, I like that perspective a lot I mean, people often ask me well if I were to make a simulation, I wouldn't have all this suffering in it. I would just become a trillionaire and I would do whatever I wanted to do. And I said, well, if you remember in the, in the Matrix sequels, the, they said the first version of the Matrix was one that had no problems, right? <laughs> it was just this idyllic world and the human mind didn't accept it. So they had to come up with all of these controversies, et cetera, uh, because that's what made it interesting. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's an interesting perspective. Cool. Yeah, uh, Paul Verhoeven said said something similar, right? You know, his movies can be you know, fairly controversial, and he's like, "Yeah, I dare you to make two hours of peace, love, and happiness, and get anybody into the theater." <laughs> right. Well, you know, in my book, I, I talk about some of the parallels with Eastern traditions, particularly with reincarnation and playing roles. And uh, you know, one of my personal heroes in that area is Yogananda. He wrote Autobiography of a Yogi, and you know, he asked his guru the same question why is there so much suffering because world war one was going on and they said well it's like a movie right <laughs> and in the film you have to have that conflict or suffering but afterwards you can sit down with each other kind of like your video game characters <laughs> that were or your cartoon characters that were you know a after the adversary and, and talk about it um, but but stepping back uh, and i think you know we're coming probably to the end of the time we'd allocated here but you know there's the hard simulation theory and then there's the soft simulation theory the hard being we are physically in a simulation, which is kind of the area that I've been focused mm -hmm. on. The soft one being more, you know, that um, the, the media, et cetera, we're all in some kind of a, a simulated sure. world because then you've talked a little bit about that as well. So, you know, maybe you can talk, first of all, where do you come out <laughs> on simulation theory, the hard versus the soft, and then, you know, comment a little bit more on, on, on the soft side. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, at the risk of sounding wishy-washy, you know, I certainly don't know when we're talking about it, you know, the hard way um, that, you know, when we're, ta when, we're, when we're talking about the science and physics of it, you know, I do kind of, I'll take for granted the fact that people considerably smarter than me take it seriously. And <laughs> I'll kind of leave it there as, well, it is, and, and the lesson I take from that is, it's plausible. Um, but I'm certainly not, I'm not convinced, but I don't know that they are either so much as the fact is they take it as, uh, a, a, as an idea worth exploring. Um, and it's funny because um, reading up on the science very quickly, you know, when, when, I, when I try to understand string theory or the holographic universe, I get, I, I get confused, you know, with my, you know, I, you know with my, I think I had one year of freshman science, you know, in undergrad, <laughs> you know, so a lot of that is well beyond what I'm capable of understanding. So that isn't the stuff that convinces me so much as, well, just using an Oculus, right? And like, I like to play Racket Fury, the ping pong yep. game. Yep. <laughs> and how authentic a social experience it is to just kind of chat with someone and play ping pong inside of this environment. Um, again, I keep going back to you know, Philip K. Dick talking about us living in a computer simulation in the 70s. You know, what were computers in the 70s? You know, giant cabinets with blinking lights and spinning wheels and punch cards and maybe Pong as we get, you know, towards the second half of the decade. You know, I, I, it, the, the leap of imagination that takes is, is just breathtaking. You know, from, 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 you know, playing ping pong in the Oculus, I can see it from there, 
right? And, and yeah, and I'm glad you brought up ping pong because for me, that was actually what led me to write the book was I was having a virtual ping pong experience where it felt so real that at the end of the experience, I tried to put the, the paddle down on the table and lean against it and it wasn't there. And that's, that's when I thought our, our technology is getting good enough that we would be completely oh, That's amazing. Yeah, no, my friend did the same thing. <laughs> <He's> yeah. like, <laughs> he, dropped the paddle, he, he dropped the paddle on the thing. And yeah, it's just like little cues, just like the sound of the ball is so perfect. Right. And the physics responsiveness, right? It actually feels like, and in my case, it was a few years ago. So it wasn't even a very high resolution game, wow. uh, but it was more that it just felt so real that I forgot that I, I was in a virtual reality. Yeah. You know, so again, it's like, well, I can see a lifelike simulation from here, you know, this technology plus, you know, I don't know, 20 years, 50 years, a hundred years is going to be pretty darn <laughs> persuasive um you know and i probably but i mean to be honest i think i've left it much more thinking of it using it as a metaphor and thinking about you know the worlds that each of us both that, that, that we both create and inhabit you know and that it may be that you know some of the bigger problems we have in this world are the facts that there's so little overlap they're never each of our worlds are never going to be identical but you know the 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 dangers that have that that you can get into when the overlap is increasingly small, you know, seem seem, seem fairly severe. Yeah, that's right. And today, with the, the political divide and the way that it is, you know, it is does that's feel one like example for sure. Yeah, ne they they will never overlap with each other. Uh, in that, you know, earlier you mentioned. Uh, uh, the nested simulations, and I thought that was a you know really interesting thread that that you didn't get to go down on. Uh, but you know one of one of my favorite movies is the Thirteenth Floor, where you know they come in and they they've created a nested simulation. They just don't know they've created a nested simulation, and then the person from the outside comes in and says, "Out of the thousands of simulations we ran, you're the only one <laughs> that got there, right?" And so they wanted them to shut it down, probably for that reason. And and you know I, I, th there was an op-ed in the New York Times, I think in 2019 or 2020, by a philosophy professor who said, we shouldn't try to find out if we're in a simulation, right? Professor Green, I think it was, yeah. uh, who said, because if we do, uh, the simulators would shut us down. You know, <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> well, I, th I think it's surprising to, like, like for me, to begin to understand the simulator's motivations seems, seems so impossible, right? That I, well, I mean, I guess I think that he's, I, I think I half agree that on the one hand, I can, you know, easily imagine a half dozen different purposes for simulation, everything from a playground to a problem solving machine to a, hist to a you know, historical research artifact, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I don't know how you could ever hope to know which of those we're in, even if you're able to prove that you're in a simulation. So I'm skeptical of making any assumptions about um, about the ideas of the, uh, about the whims of the simulators. And although we, we actually, I think we did goof around with that idea a little bit in the movie, right? Where, you know, cause at one point Paul talks about, well, if they're, if we're living in a simulation, you know, would the simulators want you to make this movie? And what would talking <laughs> right. about, and are there dangers in talking about the simulation? You know, yeah. and that's, you know, sort of a, my version of a playful way <laughs> to, kind, to, 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 to kind of bring the thing home. Um, but similarly, and I guess this is my attempts to understand the idea of the holographic universe. You know, if we build a three, uh, you know, if our, sensory apparatus allow us to see the world as 3D because that's easier for us to navigate. And is that in, in is, is that connected to that idea? A little bit, you know, this, this idea that we're creating the 3D world as, so I don't know if you've read any of Donald Hoffman's work, uh, The Case Against Reality, where he says reality is just a UI, just like we have a desktop where we have 
you know, a blue file folder. Like there's no blue file folder in your computer. <laughs> it's actually just a bunch of bits, but we're yeah, yeah, rendering yeah. it that way. So are we rendering this world around us in 3D? I guess. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I saw, I saw his TED talk and it made a big impression on me. And, <laughs> but what that suggests to me is breaking out of the simulation is probably not helpful, right? <laughs> that, <laughs> it, 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 you know, when you, I, I, one comparison I think of is, you know, I don't know if you've ever gone down this hole of thinking of like those magic eye posters where it's like those weird murky kind of paisley colors. And if you oh, right. cross your eyes the right way, like a dragon or a castle or something will emerge in 3D. Right, right. You know, that if that 3D illusion that you're able to create, you know, by focusing your eyes on this third space, if that's the world and the way we navigate the world, turning it back into that abstract noise it's not going to help you <laughs> live your <laughs> live live your life in any concrete way, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean we're so used to interpreting the world a certain way, right? Yeah, you know there, there, there's, a, there's there's some folks who might be able to get into the code. You know, I'm, I'm sure there are plenty of computer programmers who can work in the raw code in the computer, but I still need to click on icons and. <laughs> <laughs> right, that makes sense. Yeah. I'm curious whether you 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 had near death experiences in, in your kind of list of, of crazy stuff to explore uh, at all, because that's an area that, that I ended up delving into. And when people have near death experiences, they report having a life review, which is basically a playback of every single thing that happened in their life. And, and I always say, well, to do that, you'd have to record every single thing that was going on in your life somehow. And I, I don't, rec I don't recall you mentioned that in the movie. Ah. Or, or, or did you? <laughs> it, was, it was actually, it was, it was not on my board, but it is in the movie. Oh, it is in the movie. Okay. Remember Paul Good talks about going to the pearly gates and reviewing your life. Oh, right. right. Like okay. debriefing after a simulation. And we use the clip from that Albert Brooks movie, Defending Your oh, Life. Oh, that's right. I do remember he's that. In the, yeah. He's in the courthouse and they play and, and they rewind it. And, um, so well, I'm, I'm I'm glad I'm glad that we got that in. Um, <laughs> That's right. That's right. That Paul was that that, that, that Paul that, that Paul Good got there, um, and it's certainly, you know, just talking, you know, taking the conversation away from simulations to movies. There's a, I love your question of, well, somebody had to have been recording your life, right? And what, right. And, and what technology would they have used? Right. But it also begs the question, like in a lot of movies like that, you know. He's watching his life, but it's also from a particular camera angle. Right. right? Like, yes. Was there some heavenly camera following him from this one particular perspective? Is there coverage from other angles? Like often, like on Star Trek, you know, that they'll see a screen down on the planet and say, wait, was, is, that, is that image coming from a particular camera? Where did... Right. Yeah. Well, you know, what made me think of that originally was uh, I was involved in a startup that was taking a a 3D world like Fortnite or League of Legends, which you really play in 2D, right? You play it on your screen, but it's a 3D world and it would record everything. And then you'd put on a VR headset and you could choose which point of view you wanted to be inside. So you could basically see it from the other person's point of view. Wow. And that, that's kind of what led me to think yeah. XYZ coordinates <laughs> anywhere. You could put well, it anywhere. There's experimental movie cameras working that way too, where they record you know, there's a camera that someone was able to record, you know, sort of the light bouncing off of the objects and the people in a room, allowing you to, as if this were animation, after the fact, move the camera and set up, uh, you know, in, in find your shots. Oh, really? Wow, that's pretty cool. I haven't seen that. Uh, you know, Quentin Tarantino with his, you know, incredible specificity for particular film grains and stocks is never going to adopt that technique but, it, <laughs> but but it's amazing the way that it kind of reforms the whole idea of photography right that you know in that choices like lensing composition exposure move from a on the set decision to a post-production decision Mm, yeah, well, it reminds me of George Lucas, you know, back in the 90s talking about digital filmmaking and how he likes to <laughs> modify things afterwards. And of course, the purest filmmakers were not, not very happy with that. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so I think we're coming to an hour here. So let me end with two, two kind of broad questions. One, are you surprised at the reaction the film has gotten? I mean, it's, it's pretty popular. I mean, everyone seems like pretty much every major outlet is writing about it. And then two, I think you mentioned your, your favorite simulation movie earlier was uh, Existence, right? And why is that the case? Yeah, so, so those would be my two final questions for you. All right. Um, 
you know, I'm I'm thrilled with how well the movie's done. You know, especially this last year. You know, it's winning the. You know, this is a this is a you know this is a, a fairly small success as far as movies go. But in this past year, so many good movies have fallen between the cracks because, you know, ex movie theaters are closed and people aren't sure how to exhibit things or some movies don't make sense in a in, in a covid world and all the festivals went dark for a while so yep. both so for sundance to both be able to create a virtual festival that people paid attention to i think was you know a gigantic event um and yeah and i'm thrilled that you know people are talking about it as much as they have and you know there's even you know there's plenty of negative reviews too but what i love about them is they don't just dismiss it offhand. It even gets those people to kind of wrestle with some of these big ideas, even if they come to different conclusions or have you know some ne some negative judgments about uh, about the movie itself. That as a writing prompt, <laughs> I think it is encouraged. It it has it inspired some interesting you know writing, even from people who hate me. Um, <laughs> or at least take the movie. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, I'd say you know, I mean, having having dabbled in independent film myself, I mean, the the amount of attention you've gotten for this film is probably on par with big Hollywood blockbusters. And yet I'm sure the budget was nothing like that. <laughs> yeah, or the profit, but. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, that's true too, in indie filmmaking. Uh, you know, and I get, well, I mean, I'm a big David Cronenberg fan, right? So I'm prompted, I'm already, I, I'm, I'm ready to respond to, you know, his style in any scenario. But I mean, some of the things I love about Existence are there are decisions he made for instance, making the video game controllers, these like weird organic kidneys um, that, you know, are both kind of um, hilarious and gross, um, but also, you know, are just so smart in a way that, you know, the thing that ages in a movie quickest is technology, right? You're looking at, you know, somebody's flip phone in a movie that otherwise looks contemporary and you're like, wow, this thing is ancient. Um, <laughs> you know, I love the way that, you t I mean, we talk about nested realities. That's another three-layer movie, right? That there's the base reality that you, that it takes place in. They go down into existence, but then there's also another layer, at least above. Right. Um, you know, and it's got so many great little character moments. Like, not the least of which, I, it might be. I don't. I, mean, I guess virtuosity might have come before, but they both share. And amazing portrayals of human actors playing NPCs, which is a really kind of fun um, prompt to give them. There's one guy in particular um, at the video game store who's sort of waiting for him to be fed a line. And it was sort of a hilarious play on kind of video game characters who, the, the ones who are there to give you clues along the way. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That's great, yeah, wow. Um, yeah, and you know, Jennifer Jason Lay is so good in it. Um, you know, I, you know, it's funny. I, I ha having watched so many movies over so many years, I would think that I'd know all the tricks, but I'm always as fooled and surprised by twists as anybody else. And the reveal of that last layer, um, you know, genuinely surprised me in that movie. Um, you know, I just love the, again, the the way that he created a video game world without getting, you know, without doing anything to you know, without like switching to digital photography or making things fake in other big ways. There's just like little things, like every, everything got these sort of um, labels on them. Mm. Chinese restaurant, factory. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, and, and there's one moment in particular, and it's one that, the, the moment in particular that haunts me, and I get it too, you know, bobbing in and out of the Oculus is there's a sequence about midway through where you know, Jude Law, who's kind of new to this whole thing and you know, Jennifer Jason Leigh are both, they're both deep into this video game world. And he says, I'm really worried about my body out there. And I know like, you know, I haven't been spending too much time in the Oculus but I can easily imagine, you know, my family locking me in the broom closet. Um, <laughs> the, yeah. This body is just, a carcass that is in our way, you know, whatever <laughs> trip that he thinks he's on, you know, we just got this 200 pounds of meat, of red meat sitting in the middle of our room, blocking our view that we need to, that, 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 that we need to get out of the way. Yeah. And then when they wake up, 
and there's like this incredibly quiet um, motel room, you know, and crickets chirping outside and stars are out and they look around for a minute and she's like, there's nothing happening in this world right now. We need to go back into the one where there's something happening. <laughs> And that's, you know, it's like, check, I, I'm, I'm midway through this level of thumper. Well, you know what? I've been in here too long. And you look out and you're like, is there anything? But I think it's also a really scary, right? It's kind of a frightening moment to come out and say yeah. into, you know, our world and say, nothing important is happening here. <laughs> right. Let me go back in. I, I have to ask, in. have you read uh, Ready Player Two? Oh, I haven't. Um, okay. How'd you like it? Uh, well, it was interesting. You know, the, in the first film, you know, he came, in the first book, he came out with in 2010. And so there weren't any VR headsets, but the technology caught up quickly. At the beginning of the second film, he starts off with a neural interface. I mean, in the second book. So it, 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 it broadcasts directly into the mind. Uh, and then that raises a whole nother set of questions. Like, you know, how much time will people spend? If, if you can re experience anything really from a, a trip to sexual interactions to work, et cetera, in this way, as if it was real, what would you, you know, why would you spend any time in the real world? And so they, they had a limit for how many hours a day you could spend in there. Otherwise you might get brain damage or something. And so it was, I, it was I definitely assume, thought provoking. There's a hack to override that limit? Oh yeah, that there's a central part of the story that deals with what, what would happen if, <laughs> if people yeah. were stuck in that. Yeah. Yeah, and it's funny. I, I I studied a little bit of improv because I was so fascinated with the way that they were able to do that stuff. And one of the lessons that I've t I've taken from it, um, despite having not pursued a career as an improv actor, was um, if this is true, what else is true? Is mm -hmm. as a great way to approach you know fiction or all si or all sorts of you know ideas that that you play with great makes makes sense well thanks so much for for joining me you know on the podcast this has been a great conversation on my favorite topic <laughs> simulation theory and i encourage everyone who hasn't seen the movie to get out there and see it and i'm assuming they can watch it pretty much anywhere these days right amazon or other streams yeah it's on all the all, on all the vod platforms um but you know what's also nice is you can check with your sort of local indie art house theater that a lot of them are showing it via their virtual cinemas you know, so they can get, so the cut, the cut can go to them instead of, you know, some, uh, your, fa your favorite technological uh, giant. That's great. Is there a, a website where they can, you know, learn more about the movie or even see where there are these kind of virtual screenings? There is, but I, I would suggest just Googling Glitch in the Matrix movie and you'll find it pretty quick. Yep. Sounds great. Okay. Well, thanks so much for joining me on this. Great to talk to you, Riz.